welcome to the Bruce Channel. I'm Bruce, and word again. Wow, just wow. True enough, we were away last week, so yeah, there's two weeks of material to sift through, but so much has happened in these two weeks that one of them should be the lead, but there are so many leads. So I had to make a list and pare it down, and I'm still overloaded. We'll see what we've got. Anyway, here we go. I think we have to begin. I think we have to begin with the church shooting last Sunday. And although it happened in the morning and Boltons were all over the place on Sunday, owing to the fact that I was otherwise occupied, I didn't find out until Monday. And of course, just a few weeks ago, we had to open with the shooting at the Mandalay Bay Resort in Las Vegas. So last week, another deranged man, again using an assault weapon, killed 26 people at a small church in Texas. He'd had a history of domestic abuse, and we don't know exactly this is the motive, but it is true that his ex-in-laws sometimes attended that church, so did he do it, hoping to kill them? But how is it that a person can be so devoid of empathy that they kill innocent people? Not to justify it, but if he thought he was justified in killing them, why didn't he just go to their house? Why did he have to kill innocent people? I, it's just beyond, beyond the pale, beyond understanding. Of course, the rest of the world looks at us and our gun fetish, our incredibly corrupt lawmakers who are so in love with their office, they become whores following the instructions of the NRA. They don't even pass the most rudimentary restrictions. Why are assault weapons even available? They're military weapons. They're not hunting weapons. They're not sporting weapons. And we have restrictions against military-grade weaponry. You, don't, you can't get a bazooka. You can't get a rifle launcher. So why is it so... Why is it too big of an idea for them to wrap themselves around? But then, you know, we could restrict who gets them. In this case, had the Air Force reported to the National Database his history, he wouldn't have been approved, but there are still places you can get it. Gun shows, for example. You know, here's the money. That's the one I want. No checks. Sure, here you go. The only possible goodness that might come from this, and it's unlikely, I know, but still, in a poll that was taken after the Las Vegas shooting, for the first time ever, over half those responding, 51% said they favored some sort of additional gun restrictions. Even after the Connecticut school, Sandy Hook was shot up. The number only reached 47, point, 47 percentage points. But this one, this 51, it was taken after the Las Vegas shooting, but before last Sunday's church shooting. So maybe now that number's pushed even higher. All right, and can you believe the shakeups and the takedowns and the shakedowns and the takeups that are coming out of Hollywood? Bill Cosby was, you know, now he seems just like the, the grand marshal of an ever-expanding parade. But I do think it was the Cosby allegations that made victims. And over the years, how many victims have there been? Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, scores of thousands. But it made them feel as though they could, could speak up. It's like critical mass. <laughs> And there's more allegations coming almost every day. Harvey Weinstein was fired from his own company, and that company may be sold or certainly at the very least change its name. And then several award-winning directors were accused. And as soon as it re was reported, others said, yeah, me too. And we thought, yeah, we know. Men go after women. The term casting couch has been around for decades. But the the... Ramifications are, are unique. I mean, never before like this. Two weeks ago, actor Anthony Rapp told BuzzFeed that back when he was 14 and Kevin Spacey was like 26, Spacey invited him up to his apartment and sexually assaulted him. Bang. The dam burst. Just like that, the fortune of Kevin Spacey's entire life have changed. 180 degrees. Because immediately, lots of other men, actors, crew members, said, yeah, he did that to me too. Actor Richard Dreyfuss' son said that back when he was 14 and his father was starring in a play that was being directed by Spacey in London, so they were rehearsing, Spacey sort of followed him across the room trying to cop a feel with his dad in the room. So, first, they suspended Kevin Spacey from House of Cards, but as more of these allegations came out, it was over. They fired him. Out, out, out. Now, they had already announced that the sixth season, 
the next one will be its last, but the word I have is they're trying to figure out how to have a sixth season without it. Will they use what was shot? Will they change the first two episodes? Kill them off? Or maybe get someone else to play his character, by the way, you know, unavailable. Anyway, with all these guys falling away, my chances of picking up roles goes up. All right. But what I heard they're doing is the producers charge three different writing teams to develop three different story arcs. And they'll choose one without Kevin Spacey. So here's my idea. President Underwood is somehow secretly replaced by his evil twin, who's non-identical and a lot shorter. Oh, <laughs> taller than Michael J. Fox. But the biggest sign that Spacey is toast, one of the upcoming holiday season's big blockbuster movies, and there are a number of them this year, one of them is called The Richest Man in the World, who was thought to be, at the time, J. Paul Getty. Rich people's family are often target for kidnapping. Frank Sinatra Jr. was kidnapped and held for ransom. So the richest man in the world is like an incident like that. It was a true story. And he wasn't even the star, but Kevin Spacey played J. Paul Getty. Not a huge role. He only had to shoot for like eight or nine days. And the film is done. Finite. In the can. It was supposed to premiere this Friday at a film festival and open on December 22nd. Done in the can is a big deal. But he's out. They're reshooting. Kevin Spacey's scenes, Christopher Plummer will replace him. And although it won't premiere this Friday, they're still planning on making the December 22nd date. I'm not wishing bad things for Kevin Spacey, but someone ought to put him on suicide watch. There are online acting classes one can take. He has a course. I consider taking it. The master class has pulled it. Almost two weeks after the word broke, I went to KevinSpacey.com just to see. It's a nice website, but it appears to have been unaltered. House of Cards is still mentioned as currently filming. Masterclass is shown as still available. And the hits just keep on coming. I mean, it's hard to even keep up. I don't even know who he is, but HBO has kicked out Louis C.K. Another actor has accused George Takai of getting him drunk and assaulting him years ago. Stellar actor, Academy Award winning actor Anthony Edwards says he and some of his friends were assaulted by a director-producer back when they were teenagers and just starting out. <laughs> okay, looks to be another notification coming in and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to look at that at some other time. This stuff isn't partisan either. Sexual predators occupy every flavor on the political spectrum. Weinstein is a liberal. Takai is a liberal. Journalist and author and broadcaster Mark Halpern is conservative, and he was fired after being accused, and again by multiple parties of sexual harassment dating all the way back to his days at ABC News. He apologized, but you know he's lost his job. He was about to have his most recent book published, and now that's not. That's a hit to his pocketbook. And maybe he's got enough, but big paychecks, they're gone. But Halpern or Spacey's losses won't impact most of us, but one of the most recent is also one of the most sordid, and it may impact us. Fruit salad Roy Moore, the Republican candidate running in the special Senate in, in Alabama, who was backed by Steve Bannon and went on to defeat Luther Strange, the candidate backed by he who must not be named, Unless you think that fruit salad is my sobriquet, that's what one of his law professors called him when he was in law school. Anyway, he's been accused, not by anonymous women, but by women whose stories are articulated with their pictures and names of inappropriate behavior when they were, wait for it, 14 to 18 years old. In the one case, understand, he was like a young, early 30s district attorney. This is alleged to have happened you know, when he was a young attorney, he invited her, maybe she was 14, to his house a few times, and on the second occasion, he took off her outer clothes. She was able to keep on her bra and panties, and then he stripped down to his underwear and went and felt her breast and took her hand to his crotch. This is the crazy, you know, Ten Commandments State Supreme Court, the guy who was removed twice from the Alabama S Supreme Court for defying the U.S. Supreme Court. The one who says that homosexuality ought to be criminalized. Really? Feeling up young girls under 18? He doesn't... For his part, he denies it and he calls it fake news. And amazingly, 
he has defenders. Now, most Republicans are saying things like, if these allegations are true, he should step aside. But he has vowed never to quit. There is an increasing number of Republican heavyweights who are calling for him to quit. 2008 presidential candidate, Senator John McCain, Senator Mike Lee, 2012 presidential candidate, Mitt Romney. He said, yeah, innocent until proven guilty is for courts, not elections. The Republican National Committee has now pulled funding. But, you know, Steve Breitbart, Steve Breitbart, Steve, Steve Bannon of Breitbart, they're saying they're going to keep on rolling with the, with the funding. So, you know, this, the impact on this, if he gets to the Senate, that impacts all of us, directly or indirectly. One of his defenders in Alabama, State Auditor Jim Ziegler, <laughs> pointed to the Bible and said, Well, now, Zechariah was extremely old to marry Elizabeth, and they became the parents of John the Baptist, and take Joseph and Mary. Jo Mary was a teenager. Joseph was an adult carpenter. They became the parents of Jesus. There is just nothing immoral or illegal here. Maybe just a little unusual. End of quote. What kind of nut job is this? If a guy took his young son up to a mountaintop in Alabama to kill him with a knife because God told me to, would Ziegler suggest he offer the Abraham defense? And then he went on to say, it's much ado about nothing because it happened, what, 40 years ago? You know, there are crimes that are protected by what's known as the statute of limitations, even if proof positive is found, prosecution can't go forward because it happened too long ago. But in every state, there are some crimes thought so heinous that they are not protected. Murder is among them. And in Alabama, it's also trying to do hanky-panky with a minor. It's not protected by the statute of limitations. And I'm not talking full-on relations. Fondling? Even inviting a minor inside for prurient purposes is one of those crimes not protected. No, I wasn't there, I don't know. But I read the women's accounts. Like Mitt Romney, I believe them. They sound compelling. And see, it's not just the women. The reporters interviewed lots of women, their mothers, their friends at the time. They only published this after contemporaneous corroboration. Hey, let me tell you about my book, Shrink. For most of my adult life, I weighed a little over 100 pounds, not much more than in this picture taken when I was about 17 and considering becoming a jockey. But as is often true, once I crossed into my 40s, extra weight came and it stayed. For years, I tried to lose, instead gained, and ended up 153 pounds. And I'm embarrassed to show you this video. Then I learned that it isn't about calories and exercise, but instead it's about what you eat. You might say, sure, ice cream makes you fat. But there were surprises, things like orange juice not being such a wise choice if you're trying to lose weight. So I just made some basic changes to what I ate, not how much, and the weight just fell off. Now, nearly three years later, it is still off. And don't misunderstand, I'm eating foods I like, not bamboo shoots. Friends ask me how I did it so often, I put it in a book. It's available as an ebook for all platforms, and the print edition is available at barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. Hey, you can shrink too. One of the other Alabama defenders said, well, why is this only now being said? Why didn't they speak out before? The woman said why. Because at the time, it was kind of flattering. Years later, it began to feel weird. And I know that's true from two female sources, two friends of mine. One friend told me that when she was 16 or 17 or so, there was an older guy who tried to date her. He was tall, good looking, somewhere near 30. And as is true for every teenager, a teenage girl, every teenager, self-esteem is an issue. What teenager wouldn't think of that as a wonderful compliment? And in another case, it was me. I was the older guy. I related some of the story before. I was too old for her, but she was over 18. And I wasn't trying to put another notch in my belt. I was in love with her. I wanted to marry her. I even wrote her a song. So it didn't work out. We remain friends today. But she admitted it was kind of heady having an adult so interested in her. One last bit to all this, me too. Yeah, me too. In one of my first summer jobs, I delivered auto parts. I take a carburetor here, a muffler there, a case of oil here. 
we had picked up a new customer, Sunoco Station. They did a lot of quality work. I assume it was quality. They were always busy. The owner was well-spoken. And sometime maybe around my fourth visit, he was in his office, looked up to sign the things. Wow, you got beautiful hands. Well, my girlfriend at the time, and her girlfriend at the time, had some, said something similar. You know, I'm a pianist, so I don't know. Aren't pianist's hands supposed to look like that? I told him I played piano, and that was it. Thought nothing about it. But the next time, in his office again, this time he, he stood up, he hugged me, he pulled me close to him. I left, and I told my boss. They never sent me to that stop again, but it's creepy. And I did feel powerless, because what if they were going to send me? What if I reported him? You know, he bought a lot of parts. I sure didn't want to cost the store his business. So, you know, yeah, I felt a little threatened. And I had a boss. I almost said I had a boss once. I've had a boss a lot of times. But I did have one boss who, let's say, took too much of an interest in me. Now, here's the thing. Again, I was young, and I was also pathetically naive. I didn't know he was coming on to me. I mean, I'm straight. I was in love with a woman. Yeah, I wrote her a lot of songs, too. And he knew I was in love with that woman. In fact, they knew each other. So although I didn't feel threatened, it was only years later when I became aware, of, more aware of things and recalled some of the things he had said to me. Years later, my friend told me, well, yeah, I knew. Wish she'd have told me. Anyway, me too. So one of the other events over the last few weeks that would have easily qualified as the lead, <coughs> pardon me, wasn't unexpected necessarily, but nevertheless, it was earth-moving. The indictment of the president's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and his deputy, Rick Gates, it's so long ago, it's long enough ago, I don't have to recite all the charges, surely you know of them, but they are numerous and they're not minor. So all the Trumpets can say, there's nothing with Russians, all they want, and they'll continue to, I'm sure. But let's recall that when Donnie and Jared had that infamous meeting in June 2016 with the Russian lawyer, oh boy, Natalia should have, Veselnitskaya, something like that. It was in Paul Manafort's office. And let's not forget either that at first they denied there even was a meeting. And then they said it was about Russian adoption. And only finally did the full story break. Except the full story hasn't broken yet. The Russian lawyer has recently written that there, will, that there was discussion of quid pro quo, Jordan Hillary, for possible policy changes, should he who must not be named win. She said she's willing to testify to that. One more wrinkle. On the same day of the Manafort-Gates indictments, it was revealed that George Papadopoulos had pleaded guilty early in the month. On October 5th, he was national security advisor to the campaign. And his indictment is a simple one, lying to the FBI. He pleaded guilty. There's some irony here. It said recently that he's a bit PO'd that the president has thrown him under the bus. He says he lied to the FBI so as to not contradict what his boss was saying, what the president was saying, that there's nothing going on with Russia. He knew it was a lie because he was central to the activity, but he didn't want to contradict. Except, yeah, according to court documents. Between March and September of 2016, he made at least six requests to higher-ups in the campaign for the candidate or representatives to meet with the Russians. Paul Manafort, in May, forwarded one of those requests to his deputy, Gates, with the instructions, we need someone to communicate, but Trump is not going to do these trips. It should be someone low-level in the campaign so, so as to not send any signal. There's nothing there. Yeah, you believe that, and you're more naive than I was in the face of the advances made by my former boss.
Welcome back. So, a reminder, you can write to us at the Bruce Channel at yahoo.com and you can watch all of our previous shows at our Facebook page or at tinyurl.com slash Bruce Channel. So, it's a world gone mad. We seem to have lost our way and I don't know if we can ever recover, but the rest of the way here today, let's look at things less depressing. I saw a leadership con presidential leadership conference the other day. On the stage were the moderator and former presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. Now, they were asked a lot of questions, and it went on for almost an hour and a half, but <laughs> one of the exchanges you have to see. Take a look. I painted because I was bored. I mean, uh, this foundation and institute takes up time, but not enough. My exercise program wasn't taken enough, and so uh, I read Winston Churchill's essay, Painting is a Pastime, and I basically said, if that guy can paint, I can paint. Okay? All right. President Clinton, uh, since you left the presidency, you've changed your, your diet and other things. What have you spent the most time now that gives you the greatest pleasure now? Is it the Clinton Global Initiative? or yeah, building my foundation and trying to fund it. You know, it's just a... It got so big so fast, but it's it takes a lot. It's a lot of trouble. You have to get keep at it all the time. And at first, I thought, oh, I don't want to do this, but I did. I thought, you know, I'm a workaholic, and I didn't think I could be a gifted painter. <laughs> but I admired him for doing that. And you know, I think he would tell you that the best thing can happen to you in your politics is to be consistently underestimated. That's pretty good at that. Yeah. And you made, well, wait, you made me... All right, one other word about former presidents. This may never have happened before. I found no evidence of it, but former President Barack Obama answered a jury summons in Chicago this week. Yeah, he showed up. He did. Everyone there was freaked out, and people got out their phones and shot video, and of course he shook a lot of hands. In the end, he wasn't selected for the jury, and I think it's easy to explain, I suppose. I don't know what the trial might have been, but imagine you're one of the lawyers, or even the judge. You're making an argument, and you've got this guy there who studied law at Harvard. Maybe an objection is raised, and the judge has to rule as a former law professor in the jury box. Nah, I'd have dismissed him too. But were I on the jury, and had he not been dismissed again, wow. Just wow. All right, this is unprecedented, I think, in our history. For yet another consecutive show, I'm going to recommend some films. This has not happened. Bing, 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 bing. Which says more about my luck than anything else. I've been getting very lucky in terms of, wow, great movie. In the past several weeks, I've seen a few that were acceptable. But once again, two that were brilliant and in very different ways. First, Patriot's Day. I wasn't even aware that they'd made a film called Patriot's Day about the Boston Marathon bombing, and like pretty much everyone else, you know, I followed the story when it was happening. I awoke that Friday morning, I think it was Friday, to the news that the whole city of Boston was in lockdown, that the official word was shelter in place. I'm surprised I didn't know about the film, because there are lots of A-listers. Mark Wahlberg, I'm usually indifferent somewhat to his films, but he did a good job. There's also John Goodman, J.K. Simmons, Kevin Bacon. The thing is, you know, you know the outcome, right? So it's hard to imagine it's really going to be a gripping film to watch. Wow, again, like Apollo 13, where again, you know, we knew how it turned out. Apollo 13 overcame that handicap and was very compelling, and so was Patriot's Day. Oh, one of my most touchstone moments in any film I've ever seen was the end of Godfather 3. Michael Corleone screams and screams, but it's silent. Well, Michael Corleone is played by Oscar winner Al Pacino. There is a scene in Patriot's Day where the actor, and I've been unable to find out who it is, he plays an officer, has no dialogue. I won't ruin it by telling you any more, except that in just a few seconds, without saying much of Without saying a word, he pretty much equaled Al Pacino. The other film was one I'd never heard of either. Hearing me say that so often about so many topics, you might think I pay no attention. You'd be wrong. I pay a lot of attention to things that matter, but almost zero attention to things that do not. Consequently, I don't know anything about Dancing with the Stars other than my mother liked it. 
I don't know anything about contemporary music or reality shows or what movies are coming out. But I am looking forward to the man who invented Christmas and the aforementioned richest man in the world, so sometimes I know. Anyway, the film I'm speaking of is called Indignance. It stars no one I'd ever heard of, and it was written, produced, and directed by James Seamus, also someone I'd never heard of. It was the first feature he's ever directed, but he's got some cred. He teaches at Columbia Film Stop, and he also taught at Yale and Rutgers. The film is based on a novel of the same name written by Philip Roth. And him? Yeah, I've heard of him. He wrote Goodbye Columbus, Portnoy's Complaint, and yes, he also wrote and won a Pulitzer for American Pastoral. That's one of the first movies I told you about in this consecutive run of having seen and encountered some wonderful movies. You know, American Pastoral was wonderful. It, too, was written by Philip Roth. Now, it's very different from Patriot's Day. It's nearly all dialogue with only a, a smattering of action, but it is enormously touching. It's a look at youth and intelligence and youthful intelligence and intelligent rebellion. There is a 13-page scene with only two characters. Seamus himself doing that's crazy. The scene should last three pages, but I'll tell you, no shouting. The dialogue nevertheless crackles. It's a look at how one gets to a point in one's life, seemingly by accident or not by accident or accidental choice or accident and fascinating movie. I heartily recommend both Patriot's Day and Indignation. Very different, but very well-made films. Speaking of film, last week we missed the Bruce Channel because, as I said, we were busy with film work. Well, I was, but I wasn't involved in film. I was involved in an audition. Now, unlike in years past, most auditions today consist of actor getting a dialogue, a line, a line, a page, two pages. Unlike the old days, you don't audition in person. Instead, you simply record yourself. Rarely are there props, no costume. They are, want to see your face, how you convey the lines you're speaking, and how does your voice handle the sadness or the anger or whatever. But this one was different. It was for a character known as Doc Shock, and they described him as, Think Doc Brown from... Back to the Future, or Doctor Who. We're looking for creativity, hair, costume, something. So I got that on Thursday. And instead of just turning it right around, I played with it. I worked different voices. Thought, okay, how can I, what different looks might I try out? I thought of sight gags, and then I rehearsed, and I rehearsed, and I rehearsed. I can't, I can't let you know any of the script. I would, I would forfeit any chance I'd have of being hired but I can give you a quick look. So, will I get it? Who knows? But as the man, some man somewhere once said, you pays your money and you take your chances. All right, we're not getting to everything today, but we got to the time perishable ones. We'll get, we got a head start on next week. Anyway, for the week ahead, you know, I had told you November is... Pomegranate Month, I hope you've been enjoying your seeds. In addition, today, Sunday, International Tongue Twister Day. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Almost made it right. That's easier than Natalia Navaskalats. <laughs> I'm quitting while I'm ahead. All right, tomorrow, Monday, World Kindness Day. Yeah, we can sure use more of that. Thursday. You go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. If sure, why not? Thursday is have a party with your bear day. It is. All right, do it, don't do it, have a party. I do hope your upcoming week is the best one you've ever had.